In confusion and uncertainty, there emerges a guiding light, a beacon that cuts through the darkness. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello and welcome to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and it's uh, great to be with you. I hope you're having an amazing Lenten season. Uh, I hope that you are doing some of the things that are helping to bring you closer to deeper intimacy with Lord, with the Lord during this uh, penitential time of the year for us as Catholics. Uh, and if you're still looking for a few ideas, we still have time left in, in Lent here. We just uh, uh, you know, celebrated the third Sunday in Lent. So uh, if you, why about adding a, an extra weekday Mass or two to your schedule? You know, you're probably going to Mass every Sunday, which is, which is awesome. But what about adding another weekday Mass or two? So sacrificing a lunchtime and going, you know, to the, to the parish kind of near where you work and uh, heading to a noon Mass there, you know, might be something you want to do. I mean, a little extra Jesus Never hurt anybody, you know, <laughs> or, or how about this, a little about more adoration, uh, you know, maybe taking that lunchtime or maybe before you come home, take a half an hour, 40 minutes. And if you can't do a full hour, half hour, 40 minutes before the Lord and the blessed sacrament on the church, either your parish or a church, maybe on your way home from work or a, a church near where you work and just spend that time with Jesus. Just um, break open your heart and just allow God to speak to you. You know, you don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to have uh, any particular prayers in mind. Just go in there and just be before the Lord, right? Hosea 6, verse 6, I want a loving heart more than sacrifice, knowledge of my ways more than holocaust. You know, uh, and how about doing an extra day at the local soup kitchen? You know, uh, gosh, if it's like Portland, or many other major cities around the U.S., there's a significant homeless problem, even exacerbated by the, the pandemic. Um, so it, this is a big, big problem in many places. And, and, they, and uh, many of those organizations that are reaching out to our brothers and sisters who are homeless and, and indigent uh, need help. So what a wonderful way that when you, you, know, you, you do this to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it to me, right? Let, let's, let's live the words of Jesus and not just pay lip service to them. Right? So they, they, uh, pray, praying an extra rosary. Or maybe, you know, you're not into the rosary. Uh, how about picking up and trying to pray the rosary? Pray along with Mother Angelica and the nuns. That's what I do. I, I have them downloaded from the podcast on my phone. And when I'm on the plane, you know, and uh, I'll just take my rosary out and I'll just put the recording on. So I'm not praying by myself. You know, I'm praying with Mother Angelica and praying with the nuns. And again, when we're praying to Rosary, what are we doing? We're reflecting on the deepest mysteries of our faith, the teachings of Jesus, uh, his, his public life, death, and resurrection through the eyes and the heart of his blessed mother. You know, uh, so Rosary is a, a beautiful prayer. Or how about Lexio Divina? The prayerful study of scripture where you take, just take your favorite scripture passages and, and, and bring them with you to adoration. Or maybe, um, you know, if you, like, like, like me, I'm on planes all the time. So I'm constantly listening to podcasts, constantly listening to things to help build my faith. Because you know what? People say, oh, you know a lot, Deacon. Well, I'll tell you something. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. So I, I myself am constantly growing in my faith. You know, so taking Lectio Divina, taking your favorite passage of Scripture, just reflecting on seeing your life and your story and your experiences in God's Word. You know, so that maybe you want to reflect on the readings for the, for the coming Sunday at Mass. So you're not just hearing them for the first time at Mass. If you read them ahead of time, before Sunday, um, then, then you, you know, you, you'll enter into them more deeply. Because you've had, you would have had time to meditate on them and to think about how my life, how God is speaking to me in and through his word. You're now making God's word personal in your life every day. So God's word comes alive in your heart. You know, so these are some just, just a few things that I would recommend uh, for you to enter more deeply into this, uh, the, the, the few weeks that we have less left in the, in the Lenten season. You know, it's not too late. And of course, adding some more fasting. 
you know, obviously on Fridays are abstinence days, and we only have one day that's actually a, a fasting day, and that's Ash Wednesday. Um, remember, because Good Friday is not in Lent, right? Lent ends with the start of the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday, uh, which starts the Triduum, which is the shortest church season of the year. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, going into the Easter Vigil. And so um, add more fasting, right? So maybe um, uh, in Friday, when you want to make Friday both an abstinence and a fasting day, so no meat, but also maybe only one full meal that day or just bread and water that day or, or maybe adding a, a fasting day like on Wednesday. I remember, you know what? You know what I remember growing up uh, that my, my mom, we didn't eat meat on Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, not, not just Fridays, but Wednesdays and Fridays was the practice in, in our home. Uh, so maybe you want to maybe go back to, to something like that where you're adding an extra day where you're not just eating meat, but you're fasting that day. And what are you fasting for? Maybe for your kids to come back to the church. You know, um, maybe you're fasting to, to break in a, a, a habit, a, a bad habit that you're having. Um, maybe you're, you're uh, praying for your spouse, you know, um, maybe you're praying for uh, a relative or a friend who's struggling right now, whatever it is you're fasting for. Because remember, fasting along with prayer is a powerful combination. Remember when the, 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 the young boy was possessed by demons and the, the apostles couldn't cast it out. And then Jesus came and cast it out and said, wait a minute, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said there are, only, there are some demons that can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. So fasting, what does fasting do? It, it, it does. It empties you so, uh, so that God can fill you. So when you're fasting from food, that hunger that you're feeling, or you're fasting from your favorite television show. I'm not going to watch my very favorite television show for the next four weeks as a fast you know, that longing, that desire to watch that show, that hunger for food, that thirst is a physical reminder that we, you're really hungering for what you're thirsting for. What you're truly desiring at the depths of your heart is a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you're. So when that desire is united with your prayer, lights out, lights out, game over. Right? The devil doesn't have a chance. So prayer and fasting. Uh, you know, really, we want you to have the best Lent ever. You know, we want you to be closer to God than you could ever even could have imagined that you could be. You know, and that's the purpose of this show, to help to bring people to a deeper love and intimacy of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith by speaking the truth of the faith in love. Because truth is not a, a, an idea Truth is not a construct. Uh, truth is a person, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life. The truth, not a truth. The truth and the life. And we put him as the heart and the center of our life. When we unite his will to our will, then we're truly free. See, the, the, the freedom of the so-called freedom of the culture, which is really license. Moral relativism, subjectivism, you know, the culture of, of woke, the, the culture of constructs, you know, uh, it's not about people, it's about changing structures and institutions, no, Jesus didn't down a cross for structures and institutions, Jesus died for people, he died to crush the power of sin and death in our lives, so we can focus our lives completely on giving ourselves as a gift. Why? It's when you give yourself away in love is when you truly find yourself in God, right? And so excited uh, today in the, in, in the next segment uh, after our Psalm Reflection, we're going to be talking to uh, a wonderful, amazing young woman of God, uh, Monet Souza. Uh, I met her in Boston when I went there to, to speak and uh, she is someone I've been mentoring as a speaker, and I'm so proud uh, and so honored um, uh, that, that she's doing the things that she's doing in the Lord's Vineyard. And, uh, you know, so, so excited to have her on the show. She's going to be talking about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. 
boy, isn't that something every single one of us could benefit from? You know, not just young people. Of course, we want young people not to be lulled into complacency by this culture that just says, uh, you know, I want to be great. Really? Well, guess what? You're already great. Here's your trophy for 10th place. You know, that's the culture of today. No, God wants us to be great, and greatness means sacrifice. So how do we come from just the lukewarmness of our faith, just going through the motions to really being on fire in love with Jesus? So when we come back, we'll do a reflection on the Psalms. You want to be part of the show? Email us, beacon at EWTN.com. All right, you're listening to Beacon of Truth on the EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and our uh, our crack show team is in place. We have our call screener, Matt Gabinski, our social media expert, Charles Beery. Ace is not in the place today. (laughs) Ace is out, Uh, but uh, we love having you with us. If you want to be part of the conversation, email us, beacon at EW10.com, and today... We're talking with going to be going to be talking with Monet Souza, young lady. She's going to introduce herself, and this is someone that I've been mentoring, and so proud and honored to have her on the show. She's going to talk about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. When you hear that music, it means one thing. It is time to reflect on the Psalms. And today, uh, given the the, the topic that we're talking about with Monet coming up here shortly, I want to share with you part of Psalm 9. This is one of the Psalms that's very long, so um, we're not going to get through the whole thing. So we're going to break this up into two, um, just like it is in the breviary. So we're going to try to get through Psalm Uh, verses 1 to 11. So this is Psalm 9. So Psalm 9 is in book 1 of the Psalms, which means, if you've been following, of course, that these Psalms in book 1 were written by David, right? And so the prescript of this Psalm, in, in fact, the entire first verse is a prescript, and it says, for the choir master. So we know that David Wrote, wrote the words of this psalm and then sent it to the choir master to have music put to it. It says, so what music? In the manner of a chant, mut laben. Mut laben, mut laben in Hebrew means to die for the sun. All right? So he, he wa- David wrote this psalm with this tune in his, I want it to sound like this chant, mut laben. And then the last line, so to, to die for the sun. And um, the, the, uh, the last part says, a psalm of David. Okay, so that's, that's the first verse. Now, uh, the prescript. The, the, the actual psalm starts in verse 2. I will praise the Lord. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. All your wonders I will confess. So I love that first line. I will, it comes out swinging. I'm going to praise you, Lord. With all my heart. I'm not going to hold back anything of my love from you, Lord. I want to give everything to you. All your wonders I will confess. I will not keep my faith to myself. I will share that faith. I will conf- not confess going to confession, but, but to, to, to witness to the power of your love to the world. Verse 3, I will rejoice in you and be glad. Sing psalms to your name, O Most High. Look at the joy that David has when he's writing the psalm. Rejoicing, be glad, singing psalms to the name of the Lord. You know, uh, David is really opening his heart and really just celebrating and praising God. And now he goes to verse 4. See how my enemies turn back, how they stumble and perish before you. See, look, look, Lord, people who are trying to oppose you, they don't have a chance. See, my, my enemies who are trying to attack me When they see your love pouring out of me, they turn back. They stumble before you. Verse 5, you upheld the justice of my cause. You sat enthroned, an upright judge. 
So see, this world wants to judge things a certain way, but, I, but, but we as followers of Jesus are more interested in the judgment of God, the justice of God, not the justice of the culture, the justice of God, who, as David correctly states, is an upright judge. You have rebuked the nations, destroyed the wicked. You have wiped out their name forever and ever. Right? So again, this is not meant to be like violent, like God just ripped their heads off or something like that. But again, the, the, the wickedness within myself. Lord, you destroy those things within me. When I open my heart to you, when I give myself to you fully and completely, you help to destroy those things in me that separate me from your love. You have wiped out that from my heart forever and ever. The foe is destroyed, eternally ruined. You uprooted their cities. Their memory has perished. I love that. Now, again, we're looking at this particular psalm allegorically, okay? We're looking at this um, through the lens of, of Christ coming to save us from our sins, right? So remember, we, we could look at these psalms one of three ways, allegorically, tropologically, or anagogically. So uh, looking at them through the lens of fulfillment in Christ, that's allegorically or tropologically. Look at the moral implication of the psalm and how we're supposed to live our life according to this psalm. Or anagogically, looking at uh, how it fulfills um, our ultimate goal to get to heaven, to be with God forever in heaven. But uh, Verse 8, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has set up his throne for judgment. He will judge the world with justice and govern the people with equity. So we don't have to worry. When things in the culture go wrong, when there's an inequality within the culture, when things aren't fair, because God will have his justice. God will uh, uh, make things right. Maybe, you know, not in this world, but God will make things right because God is a God of justice. He treats all people with anonymity and equity. And the last couple lines, for the oppressed, the Lord will be a stronghold a stronghold in times of distress. That's what we need to put our trust in. We need to put our trust in God. Those who know your name will trust you. You will not forsake those who seek you, O Lord. So if we call on the name, if we know, in the word there, he was Yalda, if we experience the Lord in our lives, we will come to trust him. And when we come to trust him, he will never forsake us. Because we seek his will in our lives every day. Beautiful. Love that. Again, that Psalm 9 verses 1 to 11. And talking about God's love in our life. And, and how the great joy that David had in writing this psalm. Uh, I, I want to invite to the show now Monet Souza. Monet is an amazing woman of God. And uh, someone that I met when I, when I was in Boston and, and I've been mentoring. And she's going to talk to us today about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. Monet, welcome to Beacon of Truth. Thank you so much for having me, Beacon Harold. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, Monet, look, this is your first time here. And uh, I'm, many of our EWTN family won't know who you are. So just tell us a little bit about something about your background and and uh, how you got to be where you are right now in your walk with the Lord. Yeah, of course. So born and raised in Massachusetts, coming from, thank God, a solid Catholic family, but really just seeing my own parents step into their faith so much more fully over the years, especially when my dad, thank God, started to have a turning point in his faith. Um, and when Mary really took hold of his own heart, leading pilgrimages when I was in middle school and just seeing no longer was the faith just lived out within the four walls of our own personal home, but how the public witness of the faith truly was something that my parents started to undertake and really began to inspire my younger brother, Michael, and I. And so it was actually high school, uh, being at my all-girls Catholic high school here in Massachusetts, Jason Everett came to speak, and that's when the desire to be a Catholic speaker really was placed on my heart. So my education was from Franciscan University in Steubenville, and for about four years now, I've been running my ministry, A Message of Hope. It's primarily for high school and college students, but I do have people of all ages listening along to my YouTube channel, my different events, the retreats I'm leading for confirmation students, 
um, Lenten retreats, parish missions, etc. So that's pretty much what the Lord has me working on right now. And I, as Deacon Harold has said a couple times in the show already, he is a mentor of mine. So this is just really, really great to be coming together in this sort of way on your show. Well, thank you, Monet. You know, I, I do get con- uh, contacted by um, people who believe they want to speak uh, professionally. They, they want to do this for a living. And, uh, you know, I'm very, a little leery <laughs> when they contact me, to be honest with you, um, because, you know, uh, this is not, this is a vocation, a calling from God. This is not just a job, you know, yeah. and, and, and Jesus is, is very correct. I mean, what he said back in, in the scripture is still true to this day. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Mm-hmm. You know, since the uh, pandemic, there are not a lot of uh, speakers out there you know, pro- providing content live because a lot of them have pivoted to uh, online or digital content providing. And that's right. just that's just not me or that's the I mean, you you do it, too. But I mean, but I think watching you speak, um, you're much more effective in front of people. And and uh, just to, to show you how much I, I, I really love Monet, you know, this uh, past year, this this past fall, I brought speakers from Australia to the United States. Um, because they're always bringing me to Australia. And I said, you know what? I'm going to return the favor. And I, and I brought them to the United States. And we did a, we, we did a little bit of a tour, went to um, Central California. And then we went to San Diego. We went to Kansas City and St. Louis and, um, and then Birmingham. And uh, so when we were in the Midwest, you know, I thought, you know, I, I was thinking about Monet. I said, why don't we bring her out here and throw her into the deep end of the pool? because <laughs> yeah. these these guys are the best speakers in australia you know mm-hmm. and i said yeah i want money to, to, to experience this and so um yeah it was the awake not woke tour <laughs> that we were that we were on and uh and monet came out and, and you you hit a grand slam you know we, we threw you in the deep end of the pool and you just swam like michael phelps or something <laughs> you did, you, your, your presentations were awesome people really liked them you know so um, so that, that was, was with, and that was with you, Deacon, never hearing me speak ever before. So that was profound trust you had in me. So a little bit of transparency there, people. Deacon trusted <laughs> the heck out of me, and praise God, it was a beautiful few days to be with all of you. Yeah, it, it was. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And so uh, we just got a couple minutes before we uh, go to the the next break, and to come back in the next segment, we can go into this more deeply. But um, talking about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. And uh, so what are some of the things that are causing lukewarmness? Just in a couple of minutes, and we can expand on this later. Well, as you had mentioned a couple of times, there's this complacency that truly is seeping and rooting itself in society. The truth is whatever other people want to make out of it. It's all relative. Um, There's there's no essence of God in people's lives. And I'm, I'm speaking with high school, college students, middle schoolers on a regular basis, and I'm seeing this deep void in their lives. And so much of that is because the faith, morals, you know, the, the truths that they hold in the home are not present. It's for sure not being held to a high standard in the public schools that these young people are going to. And where everyone's community and friend group is all within this relativistic mindset. No one's being called higher to something bigger than themselves, which is ultimately God. So just trying to speak into that and tell people that they can turn to community and to adoration to come out of lukewarmness. Oh, that's awesome. More with Monet Souza in a minute. But if you want to be part of the show, email us beacon at EWTN.com. Yeah! You're listening to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And I still say we have the best bumper music in the business. Uh, we have our crack show team with us, our call screener, Matt Gabinski, 
Our social media expert, Charles Beery, and Ace McKay, the producer, is out today. So Ace is not in the place. He'll be back with us uh, soon. And uh, if you want to join the conversation today, send us an email, beacon at EW10.com. I'm so excited. We're talking with Monet Souza about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. And uh, before the last break, we we're talking about what is, why are people experiencing this lukewarmness? And, and to show you why this topic is so important, why I have Monet on today. You know, I spoke at a, I've been doing more and more middle schools um, lately. When I go to parish missions, if, if there's a school attached to the parish, they have me often talk to middle school kids. And so I said, you know, I want to, let me, let me gauge where kids' hearts are today. So I told these guys, I said, look, I said, I want you to be honest. I'm going to ask a question right now. I want you to be completely honest. Don't give me the answer that you think I want to hear. You're not going to get in trouble. I just, just be honest. How many of you really feel that you have a deep, intimate connection, relationship with Jesus Christ? There were about 125 kids, and I think three raised their hand. And I thank them for being honest. And I think the teachers were all kind of embarrassed, like, oh, my goodness, this is a Catholic school, and we're supposed to be teaching the Catholic faith. And, what? and yet they're not experiencing it. But this, this is the experience I see all the time, you know? And, and, and that's why this topic is so, so important. Again, to help us to break all of this open, we have Monet Souza uh, with us. And Monet, can you tell us a little, just a little bit about your backwards? I know you used to work with uh, Catholic uh, TV in Boston. Yes. So... Since graduating, um, you know, as mentioned, I've been doing A Message of Hope for about four years. I've been a freelancer with Catholic TV. Uh, I ended up being a producer with them for about a year. And now I'm just co-hosting one of their programs there. This is the day. And also getting ready to launch season two of my TV series, Anchored, this spring. So the Lord is just funny. I never went to school for production, television, uh, videography, nothing like that. But he's keep putting me either in front or behind the camera, um, in front of the microphone, like whatever it may be. And it's just been such an enjoyable ride uh, doing all these things, all these topics, all these events for the Lord. And like I said, proud graduate at Franciscan University. A lot of my uh, foundation, of course, was from my family, but uh, my second family being Franciscan University for sure. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, so we, we were, you were talking before uh, the break, Monet, about uh, some of the causes of lukewarmness that we're seeing. <clears throat> and this is something that's not just for young people. We're seeing this even, I see this with men. I, I give lots of talks for men. And we see the spiritual lethargy, the spiritual laziness. We're almost being lulled into complacency by mm -hmm. the culture of moral, moral relativism. We become too comfortable in our everyday routine. And <clears throat> when that routine is separated from prayer, you know, like, okay, well, I'm not going to, oh, gosh, I was in a rush today. I, I woke up late. I didn't have the time to pray. I'll pray twice tomorrow. And then we just somehow get into this habit, and our prayer life drops off, our relationship drops off, we become lukewarm. Is that what you're seeing as well? Definitely. And even, you know, like before the break that we had, the, the statement I made, I also want to like go back to it. I had said, you know, primarily with my middle school students that I'm seeing um, right now, I'm, I'm finishing up my third year being the edge director at our parish here in the Diocese of Boston, St. Mary's of the Assumption. And about 85% of my students are public school students. And so I'm seeing a deep lukewarmness and not being well formed in the faith there, but also our own Catholic church and our own Catholic schools are doing a disservice to the next generation and even the generation that is, is existing now, like you're saying, with all these different age groups. And we're so soft, and we're so scared of what speaking the truth will do, where we withhold ourselves from speaking it. And over the years, a lot of people have told me, Mona, your approach is too intense. You're, you're you know, going right for the truth a little too quickly. And my thing is, I'm like, well, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here on earth. Like, why am I going to drag my feet? Why am I going to wait to tell students who are before me today about Jesus Christ? Why am I going to delay it for tomorrow? And I think more members of our church 
and those who are believers need to take on this mentality of this kingdom now, not kingdom tomorrow, not kingdom in a year, but kingdom now. The Lord's given our ourselves this voice and this time to use for His greater glory. And yeah, it's just a shame to see how many people are not supporting, especially like I'm saying, the middle school through college students I'm working alongside with primarily throughout the year, but I'm just seeing for them, no one is their lifeline to Jesus Christ, and no one is drawing the line in the sand of good and bad, the truth and the lies, and it's, it's just really heartbreaking. This is Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening to Beacon of Truth on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And now you know why I love this young lady. She's a, you, she nailed it. You nailed it. It's exa- As you were speaking, my heart was like burning. I was like, yes! You, 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 exactly. I mean, you, you hit it exactly what's going on as the root cause of this spiritual lethargy. And, and, and just like me, you know, something, you're, you're, you're too intense or you're too loud or you're too, you know, but it's the beauty of the truth of the faith and love. You yeah. know, um, and, and so, so given what, what you've, what you're seeing and what we're both seeing, what, what can we do or what can be done to turn this around? How do you get somebody from spiritual lethargy, from just being lukewarm, or maybe the, the embers are sitting under a pile of ashes and those mm-hmm. embers, those coals need to be stirred into flame in someone's mm-hmm. life. Uh, what, what are what are some of the things that that you would recommend, or or what, what are the things that, that a person can do to become closer in their walk with God? Yeah, no, that's a beautiful imagery to have. I would just start with, and this is what I'm hearing from everyone under the sun: priests, religious people working for the church, people not working for the church. I think it. I know it needs to begin with a mentality shift of we're we're almost choosing who's worth saving. It's almost this, well, we've already lost the kids once they've gone through the confirmation program. Might as well just pour out into the ones who are still coming on a regular basis to church on Sunday. Or, oh, you know, might as well just draw the line in the sand of who's on fire for the faith and who's not. And the ones who aren't, well, they've already been lost. And it's so discouraging to hear that where it's this reminder of Jesus went out to find the one lost sheep. And are we willing to see who that person may be at our workplace, at school, in our family? And if we already have the mentality on our mind, most likely it's already on our heart, that we have given up on that individual. But once we see them as a soul to be saved, as a soul to journey to heaven with, then I think the disposition of our heart softens, and we see that man or woman, young or old, differently, and we can begin to ask those questions. Maybe no one else is asking them. You know, what are some of your plans for your life? When you wake up, what's the purpose of beginning your day? It can just begin so simply because it's really surprising to hear that a lot of people just go through this rhythmic, do their wake up, start their day come home, go to bed, do it again. And people really aren't living for much. And I think it's just a lot of probing and questioning questioning to just see where the person in front of you is. And once we begin to reveal some of these layers and we go deeper with them and we truly have a desire of loving them and walking with them, then we'll know where to bring them to. You know, I, I don't think one case fits all people on how to draw them out of lukewarmness and needs to begin with relationship first. Um, and, you know, I even think of some individuals I'm, I'm walking alongside with right now, which is such a gift. And that's what I'm doing. Like we'll get together for lunch. We'll get together, um, you know, for coffee or something like that. It doesn't have to be hours and hours long, but just asking them some questions of, you know, what do you hope for your life someday? You know, are you, are you concerned about the things of heaven? Do you believe in God? And then all of a sudden you start seeing this almost examination of conscience they're having right before you. And they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even think of those questions. Or, oh, I didn't even think of 
how God may want me to live in accordance with his will. Again, as you were so wonderfully mentioning earlier. Um, and I think truly it starts there. You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And today we're talking with our guest, Monet Souza, a wonderful Catholic speaker. And we'll give information how you can get in contact with her. We're talking today about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. And who doesn't want that? You know, Mene, you're, you're a, a, a young adult um, and you're immersed in, in, in your faith. And there's, oh gosh, every place I go, there's always parents or, or grandparents that come up to me um, and they're lamenting about their son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter who is away from the faith and they're trying their best to, you know, they're trying to send them Scott Hahn DVDs and they're trying to send them catechisms and they're sending them clips of videos. And um, one, <laughs> one guy, you know, has these daughters who are away from the church and he was, um, this was earlier in Lent and he was, he said he sent a meme to them of this young man with ashes on his forehead and he said, like, you know, wouldn't it be great to be with a man who's going to take you to heaven or something like that? And they sent back a meme of a baby running into a room. His eyes got real big and turned around and ran away. You know, so he was like, dang. You know, so the poor guy's trying his best to, uh, to work with his kids. So what, what would you say, um, as a person in that age group, to parents, um, what, what can they say or do to at least begin a conversation with their children about, about the faith without it becoming just an angry conversation all the time? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I was just actually giving this talk on lukewarmness in Philadelphia, and the event was open to anyone of any age. And I actually had a lot of moms that came up to me and fathers asking this exact question. And I, all I say is, because I know for myself, when I maybe stepped out of the faith, or if I were to up and leave tomorrow and disown the Catholic faith, I would still have this confidence, and I would hope my parents would have it too, that they gave my brother and I the best foundation they could give us of the faith, and to just have sure of reliance that they did what they were called to do for the 18, 20 somewhat years that their children were in their home and to trust that they gave them those fundamental principles and told them about the 10 commandments and provided a relationship for their children to have with Jesus. And that foundation will prove itself sturdy when God willing, your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren come back to the faith. So to first, not feel like you have to white knuckle your children as you feel them slipping away, but in reality to have this trust and surrender of God, I did what I could do. Now they're in your hands. And I think it's this, yeah, like when my, I know friends of mine who aren't practicing the Catholic faith anymore. And a lot of times they are hesitant to come home for the holidays or for Sundays meals or whatever it may be. And they're just always like, Oh, my parents are going to say something about the faith again, or they're going to, you know, talk down to me or whatever it may be. Maybe right now, if your children are going through a bit of struggle, the, the topic doesn't have to always be on the faith. They, God willing, already know where you stand. They know where to turn to when they want to hear about Jesus or come back to the faith. But just having a conversation rooted in love will be enough. And your children will always know that you are there ready to, embrace them when you meet them with that love each time you see them. Um, you know, whether or not you feel like you're fuming interiorly of, I can't believe they've left the faith or not. As long as your exterior disposition is one of openness and love the way that Jesus Christ is every time we go to the confessional, every time we go to adoration, every time we go to mass to pray into that and be like, Lord, help me to have a receptive, uh, a way to be receptive to my children when they come into my home or my embrace, whether they're practicing or not, I think could help. Yeah, that's great advice. I'm Deacon Harold Burke-Sivers. You're listening to Beacon of Truth 
on the EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network with my guest today, Monet Souza. We're talking about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. And yeah, what you said was really important because I think parents feel guilty, like they're blaming themselves uh, for, for what happens with their kids. And, you know, at, at some point, like you said, after you help them to lay a strong foundation, because their job is to do exactly what you said, Monet, to lay a foundation, not to build the house of their lives with their kids. Because Psalm 127, one of the Psalms written by Solomon says, if the Lord does not build the house, in vain do the builders labor. So mm-hmm. our job is not to build a house, but as you so beautifully said and articulated, to lay a foundation upon which they will build their house with the Lord. And, and if you've done that to the best of your ability, if you can stand before God and say, Lord, we did what we could. We did our, here's what we've done. Here's, you know, this, we did our best. Then you know what? At, at some point, your children need to take responsibility for their own lives and their own decisions that they're making, given right. the foundation. So, you know, so, so parents worry, but, you know, prayer and fasting, like I talked about uh, earlier, are the things that can be done to pray for your kids, but ultimately, um, they're adults and, they're, and, they're, and they make their own decisions for which they will be held accountable for. Yes, exactly. And even to you're making me think of, um, you know, I have a Bible verse here. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. But one of those lines within those verses says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and reverence. And I truly believe that could be applied for parents or grandparents who are listening right now. And if our I know a lot of people who are Catholic, but you are never you would never know they were Catholic because of their coldness or their the ways that they are not living out in this joy given by the Lord. And if maybe we don't find the faith joyful or hopeful, maybe that's even a great place for us to start to turn interior and look at our own hearts and say, okay, what what is the hope of which I am living by? Who is the God in which I am serving, and does that pour out to my family, to my children, to my workplace, to my extended family, wherever it may be. So we, yeah, we have to begin to know why we believe what we believe and have reason for our hope. No, you're absolutely right. That, you, that Again, nailed it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Again, this is Deacon Harold Bursiri. He's listening to the Beacon of Truth on EWTN. And we're talking with Monet Souza about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith. <clears throat> you know, so we, we talked about um, uh, some of the causes of lukewarmness. We talked about um, what some things that can be done to kind of stir those, the, 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 the embers into flame in our lives. We talked about parents and their frustrations with their, with their uh, adult, uh, young adult uh, kids who are away from the church. And, uh, but I also want to make sure that we talk about um, some, some things with, that are hopeful, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because look, there's, there's too many people in the church um, that, you know, that, that, that throw fire on the flame. You know, they're always talking about all the negative things that are happening. You know, yeah. um, and instead of focusing on a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, they're talking about this thing happened in the church or this thing with the Pope or this document that came out or this other thing. And, and yeah, there's a, there's a place and a time to talk about those things. But but focusing on them where, where they're becoming the focus of your 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 thoughts, your mind. Your, your, I mean, it, 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 to me, that that distracts you get pulled into um, a rabbit hole. You know, mm-hmm. and you, 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 you're, you're or getting pulled down this, um, this tributary and you're getting pulled out of the mainstream of the river that, that's flowing to eternal life. You're getting sucked down this side tributary that's leading into this, into the desert somewhere. You know, I mean, so what can we do to avoid stuff like that? Um, I, I, for me, I, I think about what Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So there may be times you have to cut people, at least temporarily, out of your life who are holding you back from being on fire for your faith that are, that are throwing or trying to douse the flame that God's building in your heart? No, definitely. I think maybe to answer that question, Deacon, um, especially where you did mention the question about 
you know, how parents can navigate their children who may be away from the faith. Maybe sharing my own brief testimony to give hope to those parents. Um, I am in my 20s, so maybe I'm close to the age of those who have children. And I, yeah, I, I just think of myself before I went to Franciscan University, I was going to a local Catholic high school in the Massachusetts area. And I remember very quickly that I was, so I was going to school for theology. I had this opportunity to really just dive deep into my faith, get ready to share the faith once I graduate with other people. I was so excited. And I found out very quickly that that culture, again, on that Catholic campus, sure, we had a small little campus ministry group, but I didn't really click with the people aside from the faith at that campus ministry. And I found myself getting really lonely on the weekend because I didn't want to enter into the party scene. But I think this is where the lukewarmness can kind of enter in. It begins slowly and very slowly. My, my longing for community started to ache at my heart, but the only way I could find that community was, I believe going into the party scene where my roommates were going and where friends of mine during the school day would go. And so before I knew it, I was entering into the party scene very quickly my freshman year through the end of my sophomore year of college. And I then, without even knowing, became lukewarm because even though I was still Catholic and I was still going to church on Sunday, even though I was showing up for the God of our faith, our our God the Father, I was still serving another God. And that was the God of the party scene. That was the devil. That was immodest dress. That was all these things. Um, and finally, the Lord hit me over the side of the head. And he's like, who are you serving here? And I still remember clear as day at the end of my sophomore year, had to pull off to the side of the road, had a panic attack for the first time in my entire life. I didn't even know what was happening. Called my parents and they were praying with me over the phone. And again, they didn't know what lifestyle I was living. I was not commuting. I was on campus. They didn't see that, but they still met me with great love to talk me down, to bring hope into my own life. And um, I finally had an opportunity to, am I going to keep one foot in the party scene and kind of putting on this facade of who Monet Souza is, or am I going to go full into stepping truly into my identity as a daughter of God and put on this, this fullness of truth of who God is calling me to be. And that's what slowly began to, yeah, just rest on my heart. And it was through a lot of time in adoration. It was actually through stripping myself away from those friends. Like you were saying, I had to, you know, distance myself. I remember the humbling moment of my mom picking me up from school because the panic attacks were getting so bad. I couldn't even drive. And then eventually I had to actually remove myself from that school, from that theology department, from, you know, what was happening on that campus. And then that's where the Lord gave refreshment for my soul, for my being by removing myself, like from like literally pulling off a leech that was just draining me and truly leading me closer and closer to to hell. I think if I stayed on that path, who knows what I would be doing now. And then he brought me into awareness that Franciscan University existed. I hadn't even heard of that school until my dad sent me the Newman list and I stumbled across that particular school. It wasn't until I was finally surrounded around a group of individuals on that campus who prioritized daily math, prioritized devotion to Our Lady, who went to adoration on a regular basis. And I was called higher now by a community of people who are like, let's give you a leg up to heaven and actually not pull you from heaven the way that this particular um, other way of living was for me. So it's got to be a pruning. It has to be a time of refinement. It's going to hurt, especially giving up things that are so comfortable. Lukewarmness is so comfortable, but as Pope Francis says, a lukewarm heart becomes self-absorbed and lazy living, and it stifles the fire of love. And I didn't know until the Lord brought me out of it. Um, he was so gentle with me, but the pruning away of this community, this school, this lifestyle I was living um, was uncomfortable, but praise God for what it led me into today, which is being on fire for the faith, two feet in. It's been a blessing. Wow, Monet, I love that you shared that. What a beautiful 
way to end our time together talking about stepping out of lukewarmness and becoming on fire for the faith with that incredible, beautiful testimony. Monet, how can people get in touch with you to bring you out to their next event at their parish or their conference or their retreat? Yes. So if you want to see exactly what I'm doing with my ministry, A Message of Hope, my website is amhlifestyles.com. If you want to hire me for speaking, voiceovers, emceeing, whatever it may be, you can go to my personal website, monetsouza.com. All right. You can visit Podcast Central, ew10.com slash radio to stream today's show. And may mighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.